and uh, activity levels with mildly low factor A. So it means that she is having a uh, one milligram disease. So in the one milligram is disease also sometime uh, most of the time. Yeah, you can see the screen now. So so the low so the one milligram disease. So in one milligram disease. So most of the time, your APTT and prothrombin time can be normal. Those are the routine testing we are doing in the laboratories. So they can give a normal value. So uh, if you no. just buy these uh, two testing without taking a proper history, you might miss a bleeding disorder. Another one, another case with excessive bleeding after circumcision. And when we look into the family history, he says that his brother died of a stroke at the age of 30 years. So with the ICH, right? Uh, right. So when we did the testing, PT is normal, APTT is marginally high and fibrinogen normal. And the full blood count also normal with a normal platelet count. So Sometimes there are some platelet functional disorders that can present with normal basic uh, coagulation screening, like normal platelet, normal PT and APTT. So in that case, if we like didn't go for this history, we might miss a bleeding disorder. So it is quite important to have a, to take a proper history in a patient with bleeding, because sometimes the testing can be normal. So what uh, you need to know, know about the history, especially the personal history of bleeding. So if the patient is having bleeding tendencies, repeated bleeding attacks like epistaxis. So if the epistaxis is there, it is important to know how severe it is, whether he required hospital admissions or any like factors were given or the need compression, so surgical intervention. So those are the important points in the history you need to ask to assess the severity of the bleeding and also to see whether he had repeated previous episodes of bleeding attacks and also the family history. Sometimes there can be significant family history with in these patients with bleeding disorders. So it is important to gather those informations and especially the consanguinity, especially in the case in the cases like where you get autosomal recessive inheritance. For example, I explained to you earlier about the factor 13 uh, deficiency and also glans thrombosthemia. So sometimes when you have autosomal recessive disorders, it is quite important to have uh, know about the consanguinity. I can see in the chat book someone saying that he can't hear. I hope others can hear me, right? Right. So bleeding disorders. Uh, so if I just explain you about the bleeding disorders, so they can be like vascular defects, platelet defects, coagulation defects, like coagulation factor deficiencies and fibrinolytic pathway defects. So it, you can have bleeding disorders at any of these defect in at any of these points. So they can be congenital or acquired. There can be congenital deficiencies and you can have acquired bleeding disorders due to sometimes the autoimmune, sometimes due to the autoimmune conditions forming antibodies and sometimes due to uh, other like, for example, sometimes in myelomas and when you have high paraprotein, you can have some acquired bleeding disorders and especially in liver disease and renal disease also you can get acquired bleeding disorders. And the commonest uh, uh, like a uh, congenital bleeding disorder would be von Willebrand disease and hemophilia A. And as I explained earlier, acquired bleeding disorders are consumptive coagulopathy like DIC, liver disease, some drugs can cause renal disease and acquired uh, antibodies like 
acquired hemophilia A that can cause acquired bleeding disorders. But out of them, the commonest are the like consumptive coagulopathy, liver disease, and drugs like warfarin, heparin can cause bleeding. So how do we approach a bleeding patient? So the, as I said, clinical history is a must. You should take a proper thorough clinical history in these patients to assess the severity of the bleeding. And usually they present with uh, mucosal bleeding, skin bleed, muscular joint, they can bleed anywhere. They can be like bleed spontaneously or they can have post-traumatic bleeding. So, for, so if you are suspecting uh, like platelet disorders, usually they present with mucosal and skin type bleeding. Usually when you see a patient with mucosal like uh, gum bleeding uh, and skin fatigue, it's most of the time they have platelet disorders. So if a patient comes with a muscular or a like joint, it's, they, they can be mostly factor deficiencies, right? So as I said, they can present with easy bruising, some bleeding and heavy bleeding from uh, small cuts and unexplained nasal bleeding, heavy menstrual bleeding, joint bleeding, excessive bleeding following surgery or dental work. So it is important to know in the history whether the patient has undergone any hemostatic challenges like surgeries, dental workup, because sometimes mild deficiencies, mild bleeding disorders might not present with spontaneous bleeding. They can have bleeding after surgeries and dental work. So then it is important to know these things in the history. And as I repeatedly saying, family history is quite important, consanguinity and drug history, because some patients can be on drugs which can cause bleeding. So if you think when you get the history, you think like this patient is a bleeder, then you do the basic coagulation testing and you can proceed with the other investigations, right? So the bleeding assessment tool is the like a standard tool. You can search in the web and find this tool. So it is, it is better to use a tool like this in assessing the patients with bleeding to see whether the bleeding is significant or not. So you, if you Google this, you will find these tools. I have just put a uh, picture of uh, the one, uh, this tool from the uh, web. So it says like it has several, it, it will give you marks. And if the marks are more than six, usually the patient is a lead. So these are the questions they ask. You can go through the, them when, leisurely and uh, get a knowledge on how to assess this bleeding. Because sometimes patient will come and say, I have a nose bleed. But it, it may like, if you go into the history, it may be just after blowing the nose. And it's maybe once in like, it, it, if it is adult, so it may be only one time. So that is not that significant. We don't need to do unnecessary investigation in those cases. So if you have a like proper tool like this, asking these questions, like how long it was there and whether you need hospital admissions, whether any interventions was done. So then you know the severity and then you think, yes, this is quite severe and you need to investigate further with testing to find a bleeding disorder. So this is quite helpful tool. You can Google this and find out. And this is quite helpful in your day-to-day -day practice because most of the people, especially female, like saying menorrhagia, it is quite difficult to assess menorrhagia because it, depending on uh, patient type, it differs. So like if you have a tool like this, you can standardize this and assess and decide on further investigation. So this will help to uh, like limit unnecessary investigations. Right? So just a little bit about the normal hemostasis, uh, normal hemostasis. So then after this, I will go into a detail about uh, testing and what are the diseases that can be detect, 
with each test. So just an overview I'm saying because I'm not going to read all these things because you can read it up and during your medical schools and its age you like had a lot of lectures about this and you must be thorough on this. So just to, just to say like if you have a vessel like injury or like wound, what will happen is initially the vessels are the one which will get constricted and all the factors platelets get concentrated in that area. So then this initial plug is formed with the platelet, platelet get activated and then they form an initial sealing to this area, right? I think you can see my cursor here. So they will form an initial seal. And then on top of this, the coagulation factors get activated and then form the blood clot. So if you like, if the coagulation factor like continuously get activated, what will happen? It will continuously form blood clots. And then there can be multiple clots in the body. So to minimize that, there are antithrombotic mechanisms to control this blood clot formation. So when the clotting system is get activated, this antithrombotic pathway also get activated and control the clot formation and localize it to the injured area. And, and also to degradate this clot, once the uh, tissue is repaired, there is fibrinolytic pathway, right? So this is the uh, this is the intrinsic, extrinsic, and common pathway you learn during the medical school. Now, actually, we don't go uh, by this. We actually go by this uh, uh, the the how it happens in physiologically. So what will happen is like if there's a tissue injury. What happened is initially this tissue factor gets exposed and to with the clotting system get activated with factor 7a. So activated factor 7a is quite important factor in initiating clotting. So this will, with help of a lot of other factors, initiate, sorry, uh, help of other factors will initiate thrombine generation. That's the next important step here. So this thrombin will form fib convert fibrinogen fibrin and form a clot. And this thrombin again activate the antithrombotic pathways because to minim to control this clotting cascade. Right? And then once this clot is formed, the fibrinolytic pathway will degradate it. So that is basically what happened inside the body. So this is earlier days we said intrinsic and extrinsic pathway because it is easy for us to understand about the testing. So intrinsic pathway, we use uh, test by APTT. Extrinsic pathway, we test from prothrombin time. I will uh, go into detail in next few slides, right? I hope you understand about this uh, normal hemostasis. You should have a basic knowledge on this uh, normal hemostasis to understand about the, how these tests uh, can be changed during these deficiencies in each of these factors, right? So if I say screening test, so what are the screening tests that can be done in a patient with bleeding? If you, if you think from the history that the patient is having significant bleeding history, so these are the tests you can do as the primary care level. Full blood count you have to do because you need to check on the platelet count. And when you do the full blood count, you can gather a few more information about the hemoglobin and white cells. So if the hemoglobin is low with normal white cells, and then you know, that there is an issue with bleeding. So that may be like that the bleeding is significant and severe to cause anemia. So, and another thing you can gather is if the platelet, hemoglobin and white cells also like all the, the parameters are low, then there can be issue with 
bone marrow. So you can gather a few things from this full blood count. And the clotting test wise, you can do basically P prothrombin time, APTT, thrombin time, and fibrinogen. I know in most of the time, thrombin time and fibrinogen is not available, but to have a full assessment, those are needed. But most of the time, most of the conditions can be checked by doing prothrombin time and APTT. So if you see a patient with bleeding, at least do full blood count, blood picture, prothrombin time and APTT if you have facilities. But of course, if you, if you are in a bigger hospital like a tertiary care center, if you have facilities to do thrombin time and fibrinogen, of course, you have to do them as a screening test. Right. I will just brief you about uh, how do we collect samples because that's quite important. We can get erroneous results because we are not collecting samples properly. And we can like see a lot of unnecessary investigations because we, we didn't look at the initial steps properly, like for the, this sample collecting part. Okay, so in your laboratories, you have, I think you have seen two types of bottles with sodium citrate. So for coagulation, we need sodium citrate anticoagulant bottles, right? So you have two types of bottles in the laboratory which contain sodium citrate. One is the coagulation bottle, other one is the ESR bottle. But you have to make sure you take blood to the correct coagulation bottle because those two bottles have different volume to anticoagulant ratio mentioned in this bottle. So if you need to take for the clotting testing, you need to take blood to anticoagulant ratio nine to one, right? So it is in this uh, coagulation bottle that is in nine to one ratio. And you are given like in nowadays, the bottles, we have marked the level which you need to fill. So it's quite easy. You just need to take the blood and fill it up to the mark correctly, right? So you, you have to choose the bottle correctly. If you put the sample into ESR bottle and say that the ratio is different, that ESR bottle contains one to four anticoagulant uh, blood ratio bottles. So you will not get a proper result. So you need to find the correct anticoagulant bottle and set, right? So from the very beginning, like from the, when you write the prescription, the nurse should check whether the, she's collecting the sample from the correct patient. For example, there are two, like for we will say, there are two Pereiras in the ward. One is on anticoagulant like warfarin, other one is not on a anticoagulant. So you, you have like, you have seen the one is on anticoagulant and then you have wrote PTINR to check the level because he's on warfarin, you want to check his uh, anticoagulation. So you have written PTINR. So nurse, if without checking the BHT number, if we just call the Pereira and if the person who is not on anticoagulant uh, raise his hand and then if the nurse took the blood from him, then you will get a normal result. So it is quite important from the beginning, you need to double check everything before you check sample, not only for the coagulation, for all the other testing, it is quite important that you should get the correct patient, correct test, correct sample into correct tube, correct amount. So if there's any discrepancy in any of these steps, you can get wrong reports. So when I said correct amount, it is quite important, especially in coagulation testing, you need to take the sample at a one go, because if you repeatedly uh, take samples and fill the bottle, the coagulation system get activated and give wrong results, right? So you cannot interpret those results. So it is quite important to take samples at a single go. Right. So just a little bit about prothrombin time. I'm not going to explain about how we do it. 
So just the clinical value I'm telling. So when you when these samples receive the lab, the one the clotting samples, we separate the plasma and do the testing. So all the testing are done in plasma, right? So in prothrombin time, as I explained earlier, we do check extrinsic pathway, right? So in extrinsic pathway, we have So extrinsic pathway is this is this drawing is easy to easier to understand about this testing. So I'm using that. So extrinsic pathway factors can be checked with prothrombin time. So they are factor seven, factor ten, factor five, factor two, and factor one. So you can check factor one, two, five, seven, and ten from the extrinsic pathway. So if the PT is prolonged, you see, you can think one of these factors can be deficient. But this is this area is common to both pathways, the factor 10, factor 5, factor 2, and this factor 1, fibrinogen. This part is common. So it can be checked from the intrinsic pathway testing also. But factor 7, is the only one that is involved in the extrinsic pathway. So if they, if you have a normal APTT and prolonged PT, so you can't have a defect in this common pathway because if there's a deficiency there, your APTT should be also high. So if your prothrombin time is high with the normal APTT, you think it is due to factor seven deficiency, right? Right. So if you have prolonged PT, isolated prolongation of PT, which means normal APTT, normal thrombin time, normal fibrinogen. You only have prolonged PT. That is seen with factor seven deficiency. So that is quite easy. If you, if you do all the testing, if the others are normal, if you see only prothrombin time is high, that is factor seven deficiency. As I explained earlier, you can get an idea from this picture about that. Right. So APTT is uh, usually check the intrinsic pathway and this common pathway area. This area is common to both pathways. So it will check these common factors and the intrinsic pathway factors. So if I tell you these are the one, two, five, ten, right? One, two, five, ten. That is involved in the common path. You can check them and the factors which are only in the intrinsic part, they are like eight. Uh, sorry, this is a print uh, typing mistake. This should be eight, nine, eleven, and twelve. So you have these are the uh, things involved in the intrinsic pathway, and these are the common pathway. So if you see a patient with prolonged APTT with normal PT, which PT is the one which takes extrinsic pathway, then you will see it can be deficiency in one of these factors up to the this common pathway. So the, it can be factor 12 deficiency, factor 11 deficiency, factor 9 deficiency, or factor 8 deficiency. So it is quite when you do both, you can get some idea about the deficiency. Uh, which factor is deficient, right? So prolonged APTT, if it is isolated prolongation of APTT, as I say, the factors like eight, nine, 11, and 10 are deficient because those are the ones involved in extrinsic pathway, right? So intrinsic pathway. So the thrombin type. Right? So the thrombin time is the test which you use to check the fibrinogen in the uh, this part. Right? So thrombin time will detect only this fibrinogen part. But if you have like a defect in the fibrinogen, obviously 
your APTT and the PT also get prolonged because fibrinogen is involved in common pathway and it will like get prolonged with both it will, the both these tests like PT and APTT will get prolonged. Okay, so thrombin time is checking only the fiber. So if the thrombin time is prolonged, there is a fibrinogen deficiency. As I said, if there's a fibrinogen deficiency, if you do all PT and APTT also, it can get prolonged, right? Because it is in the common pathway, right? So if you see prolonged thrombin time, as I said, it will only detect fibrinogen. So you should, if you see a prolonged from beam time, you it can be a fibrinogenemia where your fibrin levels are low from the birth, like there's a detecting production, hyperfibrinogenemia, where it is low, dysfibrinogenemia, where the function is defect. The fibrinogen is there, but the function is defective. And heparin therapy also causes prolongation in thrombin time. So uh, just a little bit about the mixing studies. I know you will not, like mo most of you are not working in the laboratories, but you should get a little bit, little idea about what we do next when we see prolonged PT or APTT in the laboratory to decide whether it is a factor deficiency or a acquired inhibitor is there. So I'll just explain what this is, right? So in mixing studies, what we do is, if you have a, for like, for example, I will take an example, factor eight deficient patient, so which is hemophilia A. So if you have a patient with factor eight deficiency, your factor levels are low in that patient. Factor eight level is low. So if you take a sample, also in that sample, factor eight is low. When you do APTT, your APTT will be prolonged because your factor eight is low, right? So you take another sample from a normal person. He's not having any deficiency, so his factors are normal. So when you mix these two together in one-to-one -one ratio, and what happened is like one is deficient, one, one contain enough adequate factors. When you mix, what will happen? You will introduce normal factors to the deficient plus deficient patient. So when you do the APTT, because now the factor is there, it will get corrected. So if so, that is the basis of this test. We do get the patient sample and the normal sample, and we mix and do the testing. And when you do the testing, if the APTT get corrected, we say it is factor deficiency. Right? I think it's clear to you. So the other thing is there are like rare condition, but you should know. There are conditions which cause antibody formation against our own factors. The commonest one is acquired hemophilia A. It is acquired because you develop later in your life and due to antibody formation. Hemophilia A is because these antibodies are against factor A, right? So when you have antibodies in this patient, you are like, but you from the birth, you have factor eight. At some point, you develop antibodies to this factor eight. So these antibodies will act on these factors and factor eight will be low in your body and you tend to bleed. When you do APTT, it is prolonged because you are now factor eight is deficient, right? Due to these antibodies. So when you have a sample from that patient and another sample from a normal person, which has adequate factor eight, when you mix these two, but this patient sample with acquired hemophilia has factor, uh, like antibodies to this factor eight. So these antibodies will bind to the, the anti uh, factor eight, which you introduce from the normal person. So that will bind to that and form like that, that will also get distorted, uh, destruction of that uh, factor eight and will get reduced number of factor eight in this sample. So when you perform APTT, it can be still prolonged because whatever you introduce, like the normal, like when you introduce normal factor eight, these antibodies will act on that 
and destroy them. So you will get a low antibody, sorry, low factate levels. So when the factate is low, your APTT is low. So it is from this test, you can easily differentiate whether it's a, whether you have an inhibitor or whether it's a condition, congenital deficiency, right? That's, that is the next step we are doing when we have a prolonged TT and APTT. For both testing, we can do this. If you see isolated prolongation of TT or APTT, we do this testing, right? So I will just, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry for this. Uh, interruptions right so if we like have low platelet and when you do a full blood count if you see all the other parameters are low as i explained earlier you can think whether there's some issue with the bone marrow causing this low platelet and bleeding so for example like leukemia marrow syndromes like that and also you can have bleeding with low platelet and sometimes with normal platelet in platelet function disorders right so the important thing here is you need to have a blood picture because when you see a patient with low platelet, there are some conditions. There can be falsely low platelet in the full blood count report. That is due to in some patients, when you take like in the patient's body, the platelets are normal. When you take a sample and put it to the EDTA bottle, there are some patients having platelets which can get aggregate due to this EDT. So in those conditions, we will have, when we check the full blood count in that sample, we can get falsely low from platelet count. So, so we can confirm that with the blood picture. When you draw a blood picture, you can see a lot of clumps. I think you have like come across uh, reports with platelet clumps. Uh, in, in reports because when they see this, uh, when they like see low counts, they do the blood picture and see whether there are clumps. When you see numerous clumps, we, are, we know that this patient is having adequate number of platelet, but the full blood count report gives erroneously low report because due to this EDTA induced clump. So it is important to double check with the blood picture blood picture if you see a patient with low platelet to make sure you are not dealing with pseudothrombocytopenia, right? That can cause unnecessary uh, investigations if you do, like just go by the full blood count in these patients, right? One other thing I want to stress is please do not perform bleeding time in a patient with low platelet because you are not going to gain any additional information by doing bleeding time in this patient. Obviously, you know, their bleeding time can be prolonged because they have low platelet. As you know, from the medical school days, the bleeding time detects vascular and platelet defects. So, but not all the uh, conditions with uh, like all the vascular and the platelet functional defects will give you prolonged bleeding time also. So when the platelets are low, you obviously know that definitely the bleeding time will be prolonged. So you, you don't need to pick the patient and check the time unnecessarily if you know that the value is going to be prolonged and you will not gain any additional information, right? So in ITPs, most of the time, other clotting parameters like PTA, PTT, and thrombin time is normal because it is only the problem with low platelet because the platelets are low. Initial plug doesn't form correctly. That's why these patients present with bleeding most of the time because these are low, like the patient is bleeding due to platelet, due to thrombocytopenia. They most of the time have mucosal or skin bleeding, right? Right, so prolonged prothrombin time. So as I explained earlier, you know, if you have prolonged prothrombin time with T, APTT and thrombin time normal, then that is definitely factor seven deficiency. You can confirm it with factor seven levels. 
and prolong APTT. As I said, isolated prolongation of APTT, you get a deficiency in factor nine, fact, sorry, factor eight, nine, 11, and 12. But the important thing here is the factor eight, nine, and 11 will cause bleeding if they are deficient. But factor 12, there's no clinical bleeding in this patient, right? So if you, sometimes these patients, you can detect like preoperatively if you do APTT, sometimes they can have prolonged APTT, but when you go into the history, like you will not find any significant bleeding. Even sometimes they had had tooth extraction before without any significant bleeding. So those patients, some, like having factor 12 deficiency, they don't bleed, right? And the other thing is prolonged APTT due to acquired inhibitors to these factors, right? So if you have prolonged prothrombin and APTT, so that is the common pathway deficiency. Then that is factor one, factor two, factor one, which is fibrinogen, factor two, which is prothrombin, and factor five and factor 10 deficiency can be there. And rarely there are some instances you can get combined factor deficiencies, right? And also you should know in warfarin therapy, both prothrombin time and APTT get prolonged, right? So if you see all these factors are prolonged, like clotting uh, tests are prolonged, it's low platelet value. But that is most of the time you encounter in your day-to-day -day practice in medical wards. Those conditions are liver disease, consumptive coagulopathy like DIC, and massive transfusion. So I'll be dealing now with few cases. So case one is 25-year-old female with easy bruising over one month duration. So over one month, she is having this easy bruising and presenting to us. And when we uh, dig into the history, we couldn't find any significant previous bleeding. She had a tooth extraction two years ago, but no excessive bleeding. So we have to think whether this, this is, because that means she has now easy bruising, like spontaneous easy bruising. And we, we need to think this is less likely to be a congenital one because she didn't have any past history or any family history. When we perform testing, her tests are like PT normal, APTT normal, thrombin time normal, hemoglobin was normal, white cell normal, but the platelet count is three. So it's the only problem here is the low platelet. And as I said, you need to perform blood picture to see whether there are platelet counts and to see whether there are any abnormal like cells. So if those are not there, this is a simple case of immune mediated thrombocytopenia, which you call ITP. So the next one is there's a six year old girl presented with repeated severe epistaxis. So she had repeated admissions with severe epistaxis, right? And when we perform testing, her prothrombin time is high, but all the other APTT, TT, and platelets are normal. So what can be this diagnosis? I repeatedly told you the, the answer earlier. When you have prolonged a, uh, prothrombin time with normal <laughs> APTT and TT, that is due to factor <laughs> seven deficiency, right? So the next one is six month old boy presented with ICH. So when you have a child with ICH, it is quite significant because uh, normally they don't get ICH uh, with minor trauma. So this one presented without a trauma with a spontaneous ICH. And when you dig into the history, maternal uncle has joint bleedings, right? And uh, then we go ahead with testing, which shows isolated prolongation of 
APTT. APTT is high. As I said earlier, when you have high APTT, it can be either factor 8, factor 9, factor 11, factor 12 deficiency. Factor 12 doesn't cause bleeding. So this patient is having bleeding. So it can't be factor 12 deficiency. So it can be either factor 8, factor 9, or factor 11 deficiency, right? So common one is the hemophilia A, which is factor 8 deficiency. So when we perform factor levels, this child has very low factor level. Usually it should be 50 to 150. This child have 0.1%, right? So another similar case, three-year boy presented with bleeding into the knee joint after trauma, right? So after trauma, after minor trauma, he bled to the knee joint and found to have prolonged APTT. So again, that can be factor eight, factor nine, factor 11 deficiency because factor 12 doesn't usually doesn't cause bleeding, right? So, so this is uh, when we do the factor levels, factor eight, factor nine is deficient, right? So because she, she, he presented at three years of age and had bleeding to the joint, that is a factor deficiency and after trauma. So that can be a mild uh, hemophilia because usually severe hemophilias present with spontaneous bleeding into joints or muscles, mild hemophilias and moderate hemophilias present with bleeding after trauma. So I'll give a little bit explanation about this congenital hemophilias. Hemophilias are either factor A deficiency, which is hemophilia A, hemophilia B is, which is factor nine deficiency, right? So it predominantly affect males because it is a X-linked recessive disorder. Can you have female hemophilias? Yes, you can when the factor Sorry, when the X, the other X chromosome is inactive in, in females, like in Turner syndromes. So only those instances you can have female hemophiliacs, otherwise it is almost always affect males. Females are most of the time carriers because they carry an abnormal, uh, because they have two X chromosomes, one is abnormal, the other one is normal. So they are most of the time carriers, right? So as I said, they present with joint or muscle bleeding. Mucosal bleeding are less common because they are factor deficiencies. They present with joint or muscle bleeding, right? Uh, so severity varies with factor level and traumatic spontaneous bleeding occurs in uh, severe phenotypes, right? So it is important to know about the female carrier state because you need to uh, manage their pregnancies and deliveries, right? So if I explain you about this uh, like chart, so if you have a, if the father is hemophilia, the mother is normal. So the father is having this abnormal X chromosome and mother has, mother's both X chromosomes are normal. So this father will definitely pass on that X chromosome, abnormal one, to this, uh, to his daughters, right? So if if this this couple ha has a, like they, if they have daughters, they are definitely carriers, right? Because one X comes from mother, one X comes from father. The X which the father is having is defective defected, right? So the, if you see a mother is a carrier and the father is normal, so the mother has a normal X and an abnormal X, right? So father's X is normal. So mother can pass on this X to their sons with the uh, father's uh, the Y chromosome and the son will get affected and there is a 50% chance of daughters being carriers if the mother is a carrier. But if the father is a hemophiliac, there is a 100% chance of daughters being carriers, right? 
so you should understand this uh, like uh, family trees and you should have a like no detail about their family history and about the bleeding phenotype because if females some because they are carriers they may not present with bleeding but during pregnancies and postpartum period we need to like look for any bleeding and also especially during delivery because if they are delivering if this carrier is delivering a baby boy then the baby boy is can be hemophilic therefore they can like need to handle carefully because otherwise they can develop during if the delivery is traumatic they can have ich and permanent disabilities right so to avoid that it is quite important to know about the carrier status of these females right so how do we treat hemophilia a is factor 8 deficiency so you give factor 8 b is factor 9 deficiency so you give factor uh, 9 so earlier days when we uh, like when we didn't have factors we gave cryo to factor 8 deficiency and ffp to factor 9 deficiency the most important thing is like while giving these factors you need to look into other general measures also price which is resting the limb keeping ice on the affected uh, joint and compression with crepe bandage and elevation and adequate pain relief right for the initial stage we advise to press the limb without without moving and then once the things are settling only we direct them to physiotherapy right so these general measures you can like while you are giving factors you need to look into these general measures also so just to uh, give you some idea about the products we can use in these deficiencies cryoprecipitant can be used in fact eight one milligram disease and fibrinogen deficiencies cryo contain these three ffp contain almost all the factors therefore like if there's a patient with bleeding sometimes they present in adulthood undiagnosed hemophilia you don't know whether it's a or b because you can see only the prolonged attt in the when you do testing with normal pt so you don't know whether it's eight or nine so you are thinking what to give so it is better to give ffp than cryo because ffp contain all these factors so then you can cover like because you don't know the exact diagnosis you can give that to stop bleeding right so prothrombin complex concentrate, which is PCC, contain two, seven, nine, ten. That is used to like use in uh, like factor two deficiency. But of course, it can it is a um, like a drug we use in reversing warfarin because in warfarin overdose also you get deficiency in these factors. So to reverse that nowadays we use PCC. Earlier days we used FFP. Now uh, the PCC is the treatment of choice, right? And also for, for fibrinogen deficiencies, you can have fibrinogen concentrate. So another case is 45-year-old male presented with excessive bleeding from herniotomy repair. So this is a 45-year adulthood, no previous history because he hasn't undergone any hemostatic challenges, no previous surgeries, so no dental extraction. So he didn't have much bleeding episode but he says he's having like a prolonged bleeding sometimes after cut injuries right so that's the only history he's giving so when we when he go for this uh, herniotomy he has some excessive bleeding and the aptt is also prolonged so usually factor 11 deficiency percent sometimes after post surgical bleeding so you need to look for that because like they might not give like if they haven't had any previous hemostatic challenges they might not say that they had any significant bleeding so so it is important to keep in mind this factor 11 deficiency can sometimes present after post-surgical bleeding so as i said earlier when you're doing a routine testing you have like done the aptt in a like for the pre-op assessment 
for this patient and you found prolonged APTT. But in the history, he had RTA two, year, two years ago, but no excessive bleeding. So can be factor 12 deficiency because he had history of, he had no history of bleeding even after RTA, but now pre op routine testing shows high APTT. And now also he is not having bleeding. So it can be factor 12 deficiency. So six month old girl presented with ICH and in the history, parents are consanguineous. So when we do the testing, all the tests are normal. PT normal, APTT normal, thrombin time normal, platelet normal and BT normal. So what is the, this disease? Factor 13 deficiency. Usually they present at birth with umbilical cord bleeding or at early neonatal age with ICHS. So they have like, all these can be normal, but if they have significant bleeding from birth and with the history of consanguinity, think about factor 13 deficiency. Then the only th the test you can do is factor 13 levels to confirm the diagnosis. So neonate presented with umbilical cord bleeding has prolongation in PT, APTT and thrombin type. I said earlier, if you have fibrinogen deficiency because it's involved in the common pathway, you can get prolongation of all these three tests. So the diagnosis is congenital a fibrinogenia, right? So there's a 14-year-old girl presented with heavy menstrual bleeding since menarche, right? She also had excessive bleeding after tooth extraction at eight years of age and only shows marginally elevated APTT with mildly low platelet count. And blood picture also confirmed true thrombocytopenia. In these cases, then they have significant history. When the child said like uh, from menarche, he's having bleeding and causing anemia, requiring blood transfusions, that bleeding is significant. So then you need to investigate further, right? So when we investigate this patient further, because in uh, like we do, we did uh, one mini brand levels, antigen levels, and factor eight, those are low in one mini brand disease. In one mini brand disease, you can have marginally elevated APTT. So that's why we thought whether this and sometimes can have low platelet also, not always, right? So then we thought because she's always telling this bleeding associated with this uh, menstrual bleeding. So we thought to investigate for one Willebrand disease and it is confirmed as one Willebrand disease. So what is one Willebrand disease, right? So most commonest bleeding disorder and it is autosomal dominant inheritance. So mostly they present with mucosal type disease, bleeding, right? They usually have epistaxis, skin bleeds, uh, like menorrhagia, so gum bleeding. So most of the time, mucosal type bleeding. So when you do basic coagulation testing, most of the time they are normal. But rarely, in some instances, you can have low, some will have low platelet, some can have slightly raised APTT, some can have bleeding, like raised bleeding time. So the, how do we manage von Willebrand disease? Usually like that is the commonest uh, disorder. Usually they will present to your day-to-day -day practice. You can like give, like if the bleeding is mild, you can usually manage with tanaxamic acid. If the bleeding is severe, then we need admission and manage with von Willebrand concentrate. Sorry, there's a typing error here. One, this should be von Willebrand concentrate. And um, the what we have is partially purified factor eight. There's a separate uh, partially purified factor eight that is contained factor eight and one millibrand. We give that to in severe bleeding. And if you don't have that, you can still use cryo because cryo contain high amount of one millibrand factor. So, so for this patient, the previous patient who had severe menorrhagia we can try tranexamic acid and also some hormonal like OCPs for them to control their menstrual bleed, right? 
So the next one is there's a patient with prolonged PT and APTT with normal thrombin time and theta. So the, that is the defecting common pathway. So the commonest one is vitamin K dependent factor deficiency, which is warfarin therapy, right? Fairly, as I said, you can have combined factor deficiencies. Another case, 27-year-old lady delivered a baby boy by cesarean section. So she was okay after the delivery. She delivered the baby. Uh, and one week postpartum, she presented with large ectomotive patches and no previous history of bleeding. And she had undergone LSCS also that week. She was okay. And when she had this bleeding, when the test was performed, we found long APTT with normal other testing. So this is a quiet thing because she had LSCS, no bleeding, and she's 27, right? So now she's having one week postpartum, having bleeding with prolonged APTT. So the, when the APTT is prolonged, the defect can be factor 8, factor 9, factor 11, or factor 12, right? So this is a quiet condition. What is the commonest um, uh, antibody like uh, the condition which has acquired uh, uh, antibody formation is acquired hemophilia A. So you need to perform factor levels and inhibitor levels to diagnose in this case, right? So acquired hemophilia A. So a little bit about acquired hemophilia A that is rare, but potentially life-threatening bleeding conditions. When you are working in medical wards or surgical wards, you should know a little bit about these conditions because even though they are rare, because they are life-threatening, they can have life-threatening bleeding, you should be aware of them in order to do further investigations and to give correct uh, factor concentrates to treat the bleed, right? So what happened here is you, you have factor eight initially, but at some point of in your life, you develop autoantibodies against this factor eight. So most of the time, this is idiopathic, but others can associate it with autoimmune diseases like SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, ulcerative colitis, and during postpartum period, that's what happened to the previous lady, and also associated with solid malignancies. So when you see a patient with acquired hemophilia, you need to think whether this is idiopathic or whether this is associated with any other conditions. There's a huge list. You can search them in the, like you can read it up. So huge list uh, is there. So you need to find whether there's any associated condition. That is the important thing. And also they present with life-threatening bleeding. So what can you do when they have life-threatening bleeding? Because this antibody is again factor eight. If you give factor eight, this antibody will act with the, your replacement factor eight also. So there, there's no point of giving factor eight to these patients. So you have to give something which bypass this factor eight activity in the clotting pathway to initiate the clot formation, right? So you have to give either recombinant factor 7A or FIBA. FIBA is factor eight inhibitor bypassing agent. So, if, so you have to give one of these two to avoid factor eight and activate the clotting system, right? So in these cases, you, you do not give FFP, cryo, or factor eight because whatever you give, these antibodies will act on those factor eight and patient will continuously bleed, right? So the important point is that you do not give factor eight here. So, uh, another case, 56-year-old man admitted to medical ward after snake bite, right? So you have prolonged PT, APTT, thrombin time, and marginal high white cells with low platelet and mildly low hemoglobin. So what can be the diagnose? So you, you can think this, that this is the consumptive coagulopathy, which is disseminated intravascular coagulation. When you have like history is suggestive of a DIC because I had a snake bite. And when you do testing, all the tests get prolonged because you get factor deficiencies and fibrinogen deficiency. And also platelets also get low, right? Uh, we can't have the polling no, for this question. Nothing. 
So till they uh, launch the question eight, I'll just go through the these previous questions you have answered, right? Um, Right, so, all right, the question eight is there. So the question is, which statement is incorrect about coagulopathy in liver disease, right? So response one is liver synthesize all clotting factors, inhibitors of clotting pathway, except one willibrand factor. Response two is liver disease result in defect in three phases of hemostasis, primary hemostasis, coagulation, and fibrinolysis. Three, vitamin K can correct bleeding associated with cirrhosis. Four, in liver disease, PT, APTT, and thrombin time is prolonged, and fibrinogen is low. So you may vote now, right? Right. So about 100, yeah, still voting. I will give a few more seconds, right? Okay, so you may stop now. So the answer, like you have responded about 113 responded. So 29 has responded to A, which is the liver synthesize all clotting factors, inhibitors of clotting pathway, except one Wilbrand factor. I'm asking about the incorrect statement, right? So, Actually, the answer is C. Vitamin K can correct bleeding associated with cirrhosis. Vitamin K can correct only if there's a vitamin K deficiency, like due to if there's absorption defect and vitamin K is deficient. But you like the liver has to synthesize the vitamin K deficient factors when we give vitamin K. But in cirrhosis, most of the time, synthesis part is also get affected. So even if you give vitamin K, you may not be able to correct the prolong TT in the in this instance there you can't produce factors right so that is the incorrect one all the others are correct so I will go into the uh, next uh, part and then we'll discuss the previous questions at the end right so the liver disease I'll be, give you a brief uh, thing about liver disease so you can like the most of the uh, like responses uh, uh, which were there earlier you can get an idea about that with this explanation right so what happened in liver disease is right. so what happened in liver disease is liver produced many coagulation factors inhibitors coagulate of coagulation except one millibrand factor because one millibrand factor uh, is synthesized in the vessel walls. So all the other factors are produced in the liver, right? So, and thrombocyte, like for example, platelet also, like because thrombocytin is produced in the liver, when that, that is the hormone which is needed. So when it is deficient, your platelet can be low and there can be platelet functional defects also. And because most of the factors are not producing, you can have very low factor levels, right? And some, and also antiplasmin like factors, right? So if I, if I explain this picture here, in liver disease, what happened is not only the procoagulant factors, anticoagulant factors also get reduced, right? So this is in the normally liver produce both the factors in equal amount. When there's a liver disease, procoagulant plus anticoagulant both get reduced. So the patient not only have bleeding tendency, 
but liver disease patient have thrombosis tendencies also. So you have to be careful on handling patients with liver disease. That's why we do not treat unnecessarily if the patient is having prolonged INR, but patient is not bleeding, the patient is clinically stable, we do not uh, treat that INR because there is a risk of thrombosis also in liver disease. So what we have to balance uh, both sides in liver disease, managing patients with liver disease, right? Other thing is conventional testing like PT, APTT, they do not fully reflect the exact derangement because because like this uh, anticoagulant pathways like that we cannot detect from the routine testing. So we cannot detect, we cannot assess the severity of bleeding only by doing PT and AP. Even with the platelets also same, there can be thrombocytopenia plus platelet function defect there. So if we take the full blood count and the platelet number, we only detect in the number. We cannot detect the platelet function part there. So routine testing doesn't give a full idea about the uh, underlying bleeding or the thrombotic tendency, right? Then a little bit about the warfarin therapy because that is the commonest anticoagulant we use in day-to-day -day practice because it's given orally and it's used in most of the conditions like if you have a DVT or a PE, atrial fibrillation, valve replacement, and we give warfarin to most of the patients and you are seeing a lot of patients in your day-to-day -day life in clinic setting with patients who are on oral warfarin, right? So before starting warfarin, you should know patient's baseline INR because sometimes you can have high INR value. Then you need to find whether the patient is having liver disease or any other condition which can cause high INR. In that case, we do not prescribe warfarin. You have to investigate and find why the INR is high in baseline level. So we have to do liver function solves. And we need to know about the platelet count because to start warfarin, we need at least minimum platelet count of 50. So if that is low, we are not starting because there is a risk of bleeding. And so when we start warfarin, it will take about three days for its maximum action. That's why when we start warfarin, we take we, we do the first INR on day three of warfarin because it takes some time for its action. Right? And for example, if you are starting for a DVT or a PE, that's why we bridge with IV heparin or low molecular weight heparin because that acts quickly. Because if you have a DVT, there's a high risk of getting pulmonary embolism. So to prevent that, we need to anticoagulate them quickly. So we give IV heparin or nowadays we most of the time use low molecular weight heparin, right? So that action is quicker, but long term wise, because when you, when you are giving treating DVT and PE, depending on the, like uh, whether it's unprovoked or provoked, our duration differs. So we have to give long term. So then we can't give injection in long run. So, so that we need to start offering. So we start on the same day with the uh, uh, low molecular weight heparin because warfarin takes about three days to start it action. So then on third day, we do the INR, and depending on the INR value, we adjust the dose. So usually the target INR is between two to three. In, in instances where you have mitral valve replacement, your INR target is a bit high. It is 2.5 to 3.5, right? So we monitor offering therapy with INR, right? So how do we manage high INR. So in, especially in medical wards, emergency departments, you are getting patients who are on warfarin having some sort of a bleeding, right? So if a patient coming to your department with, on warfarin with bleeding, 
then you must stop the draft and you should and if the and assess the severity of the bleeding whether it's a mild bleeding or whether it is a severe significant life threatening bleeding in that case if it is a life threatening bleeding you have to give vitamin k iv and reverse it with pcc ffp can be used if you don't have pcc when giving prothrombin complex concentrate you should keep in mind that like if you give a uh, more like uh, like if you give a uh, amount which is like you have to give a minimum amount if you give more you what to, it can cause is it can cause sometimes thrombosis so you have to be careful in giving that so you have to stop warfarin we have to, first you assess the bleeding and stop warfarin and give vitamin k and if it is a life threatening severe bleeding only we give 5 to 10 mg otherwise you should we give less than 5 mg because we don't need to co completely reverse the warfarin action especially in patients who are on warfarin for heart valve replacement because if you completely reverse the action with giving 10 mg what happens is you it is very difficult to uh, re anticoagulate them again once the bleeding is settled right but if you have a life threatening bleeding of of course you should give uh, uh, sometimes you may have to give 10 mg otherwise it should be either 2 mg or 5 mg right and if it is a my like if the patient is not having bleeding and the inr is a little bit high around 4 what you can do is you can reduce the dose and see them in the clinic you don't need to admit them and if the inr is about 4 again and less than 10 about four but less than 10 if the patient is on like you can withhold the warfarin and you can give some oral vitamin k in your clinic you don't need to admit them right make sure but if the patient is from far away if the patient cannot come to the hospital if he has bleeding like if there's no reliability in that then you need to admit because we want to prevent like unnecessary deaths if we develop a ICH or ICH. So in that case only we admit, but if the patient is reliable and if you can monitor them quite frequently in your clinic, you can give per, per like oral vitamin K and PV them, right? And make sure you need to find the reason to have a high INR because sometimes some patients are on antibiotics which can cause, which can increase INR, right? So in that case, you need to find the exact like underlying cause and correct that cause. Sometimes when the patient has other condition, like sometimes the patient is going into liver failure, then you need to check that also. So you need to have, find the cause and correct the underlying cause before you restart the warfarin. Right? right. So thank you. That's all. And we'll... Uh, on to the previous questions now. Right. So the second question, uh, so you're answering the number six now. What is the condition that cause prolongation of TT, APTT and TT? So if you have listened to the lecture carefully, now you can give the correct answer. I'll give a few more seconds, right? The question is prolongation of TT, APTT, and thrombin time, all three, right? Right, I think uh, you may stop calling now. So, like, uh, the answer is yes, 85% has given the correct answer, which is A, A fibrinogenemia. Some has a few, 10% has given warfarin therapy. Uh, no, warfarin therapy will give you uh, like only TT, APTT prolongation it will not act on fibrinogen, right? So, and uh, so it will not give prolonged PT and other two are off, right? The answer is A. So we'll go to question number two, yeah. Yeah. What factors are deficient in vitamin K deficiency? Response one, factor two, Seven, nine, ten, B, five, and ten, 
C, 8, 9, 10. And D should be factor 13, right? If there's some typing mistake there, it should be factor 13. I'll give you another two minutes, sorry, two seconds, two, three seconds, right? So you may stop 14 now. So the answer is uh, number one, 90% has given the correct answer, two, seven, nine, 10, vitamin K deficiency. The factors affecting are two, seven, nine, 10. The seven percent has given the answer eight nine eleven. That is uh, that is not uh, vitamin K dependent. Eight is not vitamin K dependent. So the answer is wrong. The answer is eight. Right? We'll go to the next one. Right. What is the condition that doesn't cause prolonged PT? Which doesn't cause right prolonged PT? A is vitamin K deficiency, B warfarin therapy, hemophilia A, liver disease. An answer should be doesn't, which doesn't cause prolonged prothrombin time, PT, right? Right, okay. So the answer is C, hemophilia A, that will cause prolongation in APTT. All the other things, vitamin K deficiency, warfarin therapy, liver disease, they can cause prolongation in PT, right? So the next one. This question is prolongation of APTT seen in A, factor seven deficiency, factor nine deficiency, factor 13 deficiency, class one thrombosthenia. Okay, so the answer is factor nine deficiency. APTT is prolonged in factor nine deficiency. In factor 13 and class one, your clotting will not get deranged. Factor seven, PT will get prolonged, right? Next one. Yeah. What is the condition that doesn't cause, same thing maybe, oh, no. no, sorry. What is the condition that doesn't cause prolonged APTT, right? A, hemophilia A, hemophilia B, liver disease, warfarin therapy, factor seven deficiency, right? Yes, most of you have given the correct answer, which is E, factor 7 deficiency. It doesn't cause APTT prolongation. All the other conditions will cause APTT prolongation, right? Next one, number six. Seven, seven, six, seven, nine. Seven, seven, eight. So the next one, what is the condition that cause prolongation of APTT, APTT and TT with low platelet, right? All the clotting tests are deranged with low platelet. Answer A is warfarin therapy, B, DIC, vitamin K deficiency, C, D, hemophilia, sorry, uh, D, D, hemophilia A. Okay. So most of your 98% has given the correct answer, which is DIC. That is the condition which can cause consumptive coagulopathy, which can cause low platelet and clotting derangement, right? So that's all the, for these uh, questions. So if you have any question, you can. Thank you very much, madam, uh, for the fruitful lecture. Uh, and we apologize for uh, all the technical errors we met during the lecture. Uh, now uh, we can move uh, on to your qu uh, question. Uh, please, madam, a little bit elaborate on uh, Rotem. Right, Rotem is, uh, it's actually, it's another lecture. Rotem is, a, uh, I think they can hear me. Rotem is the uh, test which we do as a global hemo hemostasis testing. It, it will not detect uh, different different pathways. It will detect from the clot formation to the fibrinolysis. It will detect e each step of clotting. But uh, the, there are like that is the basis of the Rotem. You add uh, several reagents. And you check the fibrinogen pathway and the platelet action and clotting factors. So we detect all these things in a single test. 
and uh, the problem is you cannot use rotum to diagnose a disease because you will not get uh, where is the exact defect is. For example, you can say there is a defecting cutting factors, but you cannot say what factor is deficient in rotum. So it is basically a bedside testing, right? So it's a point of care testing where you, when you have a like a massive bleeding, massive transfusion, where you need to act quickly. You need to see which uh, part of the protein system is affected to give factors. So in that case, what you would do is you do rotum and then see the graphs and see whether the platelet is deficient, then you give platelet. So to so in those settings, that is useful, right? Then madam, uh, what is the suitable tube to collect blood for rotum? Rotum you do in whole blood, so citrated tube can be used. What are the normal time durations of uh, PT, APT, APTT, BT, and uh, clotting time? Right. Yeah, normal time durations. Like uh, normally, TT is like 12 to 14 seconds we take, right? So APTT usually, it depends. Actually, even though I said they are normal, but depending on the laboratory, you have to have a separate normal uh, range for your laboratory. You have to do testing and calculate that, right? So normally what we take is uh, APTT up to, some laboratory takes 35, some takes 40. So you have to check with your lab and see what is the normal value, upper limit they are taking, right? And if we, because you said about BT and CT, actually clotting time I do not uh, like um, promote uh, performing clotting time because it will not give anything to you. Because when you have TT, APTT, and thrombin time, you don't need to do a clotting time unless you are like checking for the snake bite, like whole blood clotting time testing. For other like routine surgeries and for bleeding patients, you don't need to do clotting time because you have this PT, APTT, and thrombin time, which are specific to each pathway of the clotting. So you can diagnose this is correctly. By doing clotting time, you won't get anything. BT also is the same. Like BT, I do not uh, advise to do in routine practice because BT will again, even though you have a normal bleeding time, the patient can be a bleeder because bleeding time, you detect only platelet and vascular defects. So no point of doing those testing, right? Uh, Madam, what is the action of von Willebrand factor? Yeah, von Willebrand is like, uh, is actually act on platelets and it will have to aggregate platelets and it, it is involved in initial uh, uh, clotting uh, activations, right? And because like you can read it up that when you take von Willebrand, you have like, you have, it's another lecture. So you can read it up. Basically, what happened is that, right? Is one Willebrand factor is an inhibitor of uh, coagulation? No, one Willebrand factor is not an inhibitor of coagulation. It involves in clot formation. You can read it up, right? What is the uh, action of factor thirteen? Factor thirteen is comes at the end of the uh, clotting pathway. Uh, can I share the, this thing again, just for a moment? Yeah, can you see the slides now? Yeah, I'll just go to the uh, this path there. You can see this now, like for factor 13 comes. Uh, I can't, I don't think you can see my cursor, no? Can you see the cursor? Oh, yeah. No, that's okay, right? Factor 13 comes at the end of the cutting, uh, right? Yeah, just go to this uh, picture so it's easy. Uh, can you see my cursor? Yeah, this is the like the clot is formed and factor 13 comes here, right? We are to stabilize this clot. Activate factor 13, what will it do is, this is the factor 13. It will bind with fibrin. When the fibrinogen converts to fibrin, bind with fibrin and it will stabilize this clot. That is the action of factor 13. Okay, you can go through this 
uh, in your textbooks. So it will give you an idea on what factor 13 does. So it will stabilize the clot. That's why it will not be detected in any of the clotting testing. And then what about clotting factor 4? Clotting factor 4, we don't have one. Um, then uh, perioperative targets in severe hemophilia for major surgery. Yeah. Uh, perioperative targets, depending on the surgery, like as you said, major surgeries also, if it is a CNS, it is different. If it is an abdominal surgery, that is again a different value. So depending on the surgery type, you have to have targets. So for example, I just tell the broader uh, targets like for a CNS and eye surgeries, usually you should have 100% levels, right? And if it is abdominal, sometimes 50 to 80% would be enough, okay? So depending on the site, you need to get the targets. What is the value of INR in relation to bleeding? Uh, I really don't get that question. You, you mean like if the patient is on, I don't know, uh, probably you are meaning if the patient is on warfarin. If the patient is on warfarin, even the INR is within normal range, some patients can bleed. So then you have to investigate whether this bleeding is due to warfarin or whether there's any local thing causing the bleeding. So probably I don't know what exactly you are meaning. Uh, we cannot, like some patients with even with INR10, they can present without bleeding. So we cannot correlate those two, but if the INR is very high, like more than eight, we are most of the time cautiously uh, monitoring them because they can have ICHS major bleeding like GI bleeding, right? I hope that will answer your question, but I'm not exactly sure what you are asking. And then, madam, if there is a single episode of epistaxis for no reason, do we have to investigate or can wait? Yeah, you, you can wait, like depending on the age. And you have to see, as I said, you can do the bleeding assessment tool and, assess, and also the family history. You can check all those things. And with the epistaxis, you can check whether they have any other bleeding histories like previous bleeding from cut injuries and things like that but if the if it is a child usually with respiratory infections with sneezing they can have small amount of bleeding so in that case you can wait but if the bleeding is significant which requiring hospital admissions and not related to any viral infection or sneezing or anything then you might have to investigate it all depend on your like other history and uh, patient type Right. Uh, Madam, can a patient who is on long-term aspirin have bleeding tendency even he is having normal floating screening test? Yes, because aspirin we cannot detect from the normal routine clotting screening like PT, APT from wind time and even like sometimes BT can be normal. But aspirin can give a platelet functional effect. So they can have a bleeding tendency. After recovery from COVID, any preventive therapy to avoid possible thrombotic events? And it depends. Like uh, it's a totally different question. Uh, COVID, yeah, COVID is there is a thrombotic risk with COVID and microvascular thrombi formation and and also risk of DVT, PEs are there in conversion phase and in the like in the post-COVID period. So the guidelines usually says, like, if you have a very severe, like you, you start prophylactic uh, anti like therapy also when you have severe, like oxygen dependency, you consider when you start uh, prophylactic for uh, like thromboprophylaxis in COVID patients. So discharging, unless you have a PE, diagnosed PE or VTE, usually, the, they will not be given thromboprophylaxis. But you can say like if the patient is having high risk for thrombosis, if there are any high risk conditions which can cause thrombosis in the patient, then you can cons consider some short-term thromboprophylaxis for, for, for that convalescent period, like 
four weeks to six weeks period. Right? Otherwise, thrombophlegic axes are given on the hospital admitted patient, depending on the severity, moderate or severe disease. Yes, you give thrombophlegic axis, but on discharge, again you assess the patient's condition and decide on that. Usually, we don't give. But if you think the patient is having very high risk for thrombosis, yes, then you can consider. Yes, next one, please. How to manage ear bleeding? The next question is how to manage. how to manage ear bleeding in acute setup if eardrum is not traumatized. Uh, usually, this bleeding patient doesn't present with ear bleeding. There's no trauma to the ear. Usually, they I haven't seen actually any, any of these bleeding patients getting spontaneous ear bleeding after like with these deficiencies, they may can have, but I haven't seen. So the only thing is if it is a factor deficiency, you have to give factors. If it is due to platelet, then you have to give platelet. But most importantly, because it is not a common thing to have ear bleed, you need to find whether there's any trauma to the ear, right? So the next one is, what are the causes for coagulopathy seen in massive transfusion? Yes. Uh, that is again another lecture because a uh, massive transfusion cause uh, uh, type of consumptive coagulopathy and due to hypothermia and uh, the factor levels get uh, like are not acting properly and also dilutional effects can cause uh, dilution in the factor levels. So factors that also can cause coagulopathy and again with massive transfusion you can develop DIC that also can cause coagulopathy, so hypothermia, uh, dilution. So those things uh, comes for the causes for coagulopathy. So that's a, another vast area. Mm -hmm. It's a, uh, it's mm -hmm. another lecture you have, you can read it up later, right? Uh, the next one is how to calculate amount of factor need to correct according to percentage. Yeah, it, uh, you haven't mentioned which uh, disease. If it is hemophilia A, you usually calculate according to your body weight. Even in hemophilia B, like the factor 9 deficiency, it's the same. So you calculate the amount needed according to your body weight, right? So they, for example, if you need to have a surgery, CN, uh, say CNS surgery, you need to have 100% correction. So you need to have 100%, right? So if, you, if it is a severe one, we completely give, we give the 100% directly. If it is a moderate or a mild one with the factor level of 10. So that is a mild case now. So you deduct that 10 from that 100, 90%, you increase by 90% to that uh, by giving factors. So you calculate them according to the body weight. So you usually for factor eight, what we do, the amount you need to increase, example, 90% into body weight, you divided it by a factor, which is two. That is, uh, that is a factor we use depending on the distribution and the half life. That is two. So you you go by factor eight like that. Factor nine, you just uh, the amount increment into body weight. You don't have a dividing factor there, right? Uh, patient on warfarin for pulmonary embolism is having COVID pneumonia, do we stop the warfarin and give therapeutic enoxaparin dose? Yes, pulmonary embolism, probably he had uh, warfarin before pulmonary, like before having COVID. So he's on long-term warfarin, I suppose what you're meaning is that. And having COVID pneumonia now, do we, yes. The issue is with COVID, you can have DIC, low platelet, those things can happen. So if the patient is on warfarin, there is a risk of bleeding because it is difficult to reverse. It has longer half-life and difficult to reverse in acute setting. So in that case, better to switch to 
low molecular weight heparin during that phase right uh, next question is uh, <laughs> giving im injections for patients who are with bleeding tendency example on warfarin therapy you want to know what uh, you want to know about im injection right so it is like yes warfarin therapy patient yes they can get im injection for example the commonest thing what we are giving is covid vaccine yes they can get the vaccine with a minimum like the small gauge uh, needle like 25 to 27 small gauge needle if the INR is within therapeutic range, two to three, they can get that IM injection without any complications. You have to use a small gauge and INR should be within therapeutic range. And also you can apply five to 10 minute direct pressure to the site. Warfarin uh, can be given if platelet more than three, 30,000 or 50,000. 50, Usually we, our target is 50,000. If it is below, we are not giving warfarin. But of course, low molecular weight heparin. Again, the therapeutic dose, we are giving about 50,000. But if the platelets are low like 30,000, we can reduce the dose to prophylactic dose and give in low molecular weight heparin, not with warfarin. Warfarin because you only have a target INR. It is that is only that for the prophylactic and therapeutic, you only have that two to three INR. So you, you don't give warfarin unless the platelets are 50 or above, right? That's all I think. Huh? Yeah. Right? I hope uh, all the questions have been answered. So, yeah. Thank you very much, madam, uh, again, uh, for this uh, very useful lecture. Uh, so I think uh, for all of you uh, had a, a good uh, idea about the uh, topic about the bleeding. Uh, so uh, we have now uh, sent the link uh, for this chat to get the e-certificate for participation. So uh, you can uh, fill it that, fill it now. Thank you very much for all participants. Right. Okay. Thank you. Right. If you have any question, you can like write to them and they can direct to me and then I can uh, uh, answer via email to you all. So you can do like that. Right. Okay. Right. Thank you.